Hello everybody and welcome back to episode 130 of the Everton Motor Racing Podcast. I hope you're well. We've got a bit of a break now between MotoGP rounds, so I thought it'd be a good time to get on the fantastic, the very well-loved actually, a kind of a paddock and fan favourite, Mr. Max Flinders onto the podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's good to finally be in here. I mean, you guys have sponsored us for four years, so... I've been ready to get on the show for a while. <laughs> yeah, it has been a while, and I'm, I've been really looking forward to it, actually, because we were just having a chat then, and um, we're kind of from a similar area as well, which is mental. <laughs> yeah, I know. it's like we're so far apart now, but yeah, I lived right next to you, like right near you right now. Yeah, so. it's absolutely bonkers. But yeah, and you've got so much going on at the moment with the baggers and super bikes, and yeah, it's it's really interesting, and I really want to dig into it really <laughs> yeah i'm i'm open to all topics of discussion <laughs> really well i always like to start off really with obviously a rider that well with riders in general when i speak to them about asking firstly obviously you're british yep so <laughs> and you're in america how how did that happen <laughs> um so yeah no i i grew up in england like i said i was born in preston uh right near you and uh uh then we moved to burton i started uh grass tracking um so me my dad he named me max after max biagi when i was oh, born nice. so Perfect. i was kind of born into racing and we started grass tracking when i was six and then when i was eight i won a championship at nine i won two more championships and uh Dang. 10 I won another two so i was getting i was doing really well in the grass track community uh it was an awesome time, made great friends, you know, uh, traveled all over England, which is small compared to America. But oh, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, it was an absolute blast. But ever since I, you know, I was born, my dad was always into road racing. And in England at the time, you couldn't start riding like a 125 two stroke on like tracks until you were 15. And in mm. um, America, you could do it at 12. So um at that time too dad was looking at kenny roberts wayne rainey like all these amazing riders kevin schwantz and he's like all these guys coming from america so there might be something over there that we could hop onto so dad got offered a job in america he snatched it we flew Mm -hmm. over we moved to louisiana which is a very southern part of america and it was a bit of a culture shock i'm not gonna lie (laughs) um yeah yeah, and uh worlds apart oh absolutely like i came here and it went from you know hanging out very prim and proper in england to just people blowing up stuff and driving around in trucks and mud in it was it was fun i was not gonna lie i I had a great time growing up yeah it sounds um, amazing (laughs) yeah and then uh we went and started road racing at 12 and just kept going won a couple championships with usgpru at 16 i hopped in the professional series with my r6 and then kind of ran out of money and then i got picked up by a team and i've been lucky to stay with that team till i was well, now and then i got picked up by another team last year for the baggers so i've been racing since i could pretty much think <laughs> yeah it's well if you're named after max biaggi then it's pretty much in your blood isn't it <laughs> yeah exactly exactly i mean the coolest thing this year or last year i i got to meet max biaggi in person no way. yeah at laguna seca and that we were walking over i told my dad i was like dad be cool like please like don't just freak chill, out <laughs> just chill out because dad dad gets a little tongue-tied sometimes especially when he's talking to wayne rainey it was hilarious but i met him and dude max biaggi super cool guy super down to earth I told him the story. He's like, kind of like, oh, that's really cool, like that. Hopefully, we didn't come off creepy, but <laughs> you know, he, no, dead awesome guy. He was really nice. Yeah, he's, he seems. He seems considering all he's achieved in racing as well, six yeah. world titles, you know, four two fifty titles, two super bikes. He doesn't really need to give anybody the time, does he? No, he could have just blown me off completely but yeah. i did go up to him my leathers so i was like oh, you know hopefully that will give me he's one of us <laughs> yeah yeah it's like oh he does it too you know so yeah he gets hopefully. it <laughs> yeah nice and that was at laguna for the moto america round i'm assuming yeah yeah moto america I, I didn't even know he was there all of a sudden i heard over the tannoy oh and our guest speaker max biaggi and i just dropped everything i was like yeah, like, right. I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to find this man right now. So, oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. It seems most America's over the last few years is picking up. I've noticed it is. from here, it is. like, 
the popularity is growing. Obviously, if it can attract top riders. Obviously, Tony Elias went there a few years ago in the championship. Then Loris Baz, then Lilo Petrucci. Loris Baz is going back now. And obviously, Javi Fores was there last year. Yeah, it's it's, it's definitely growing. It's, I think that, honestly, Tony Elias came over and I feel like that helped a lot because, you know, he's he's won Moto2. He's won races in MotoGP. Like, he's a top-class rider. And he came over here and everyone was like, oh, you know, he's going to walk it. He's going to dominate. He's going to kick everyone's butts. That's mm. it. And he didn't. He struggled. He fought. Like, yeah, he got a championship, but, like, it was well-earned. It wasn't given to him. So that kind of showed how good the riders are in America. And I think it kind of brought attention to it. And then, you know, Ducati got involved. And Ducati, obviously, in MotoGP, they've got, what, six, seven, eight bikes out there now. Like, they want to win bad. So the fact that they come over here and, you know, Yamaha's still beating them, that's bringing them to bring better people over as well. So, mm. yeah, it's it's definitely showing what America's got. It's really cool, I think. And they've just grown and grown. And they introduced the baggers. And then that got more of the American crowd in because that's what everyone rides over here. So, <laughs> um, yeah, no, they're they're doing the right stuff. I, I hope it just keeps progressing for sure. Yeah, me too, because it is a spectacle. Like, we can't really watch it over here anymore. It used to be in Eurosport. And then mm-hmm. now you have to watch the Moto America Plus thing you have to pay a subscription for it which is a bit frustrating because i used to love watching it i'd always tune in every time and watch the races i remember a few years ago it was sdk versus escalante every single weekend them just i'm not gonna lie that was that was some of the best racing like i would always watch the 600 race because Mm. it was really cool because you sean dylan kelly knew that if escalante got in front and got a gap he was so consistent that Sean would have to do everything he could to get it back. So yeah. Sean would just, every time Escalante would come past, Sean knew he had to attack back. And it just made such good racing. It was oh, awesome. It was awesome. Unbelievable. I think one that stands out to me, I think it was Road America. And it was, I think it was like one of the final laps. And I think they both crashed. Yeah. To... <laughs> turn five. Yeah. I yeah. remember that. <laughs> it was like what is going on <laughs> yeah it was crazy i was like oh my god i can't believe they just did that and then it was like and then third place came through i think it was was it pj or was it rocker i think it was i think it was like a ah oh, his name i'm thinking I, does he run number 50 i can't bobby think of his Fong? name now no it wasn't bobby ah oh, oh. he moved the super bike he wears day and easy levers if, I, if I'm thinking it right. I'm trying to think. Was it, it wasn't Ben Smith. He's 88. Um, I, I think it was Ben Smith. I think it oh. was his first win. Oh, I'm okay. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I'm, I, think it was, I know Ben Smith it. was racing in that class and it could have been him for sure because he's an excellent rider. For sure. Yeah, he's class. Let's have a look. I'm actually intrigued now. I've got to find out. <laughs> um, who won this? Which, yeah, right. I've got Somebody saying in the forum. It was 2021 anyway, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was before Sean went to Moto2, yeah. Yeah, he was. It was, yeah. I'm not going to be able to find it, I don't think. But it was somebody. I think it was their first victory. Yeah, I could probably have been Ben then. I hope it was Ben. <laughs> yeah, he's. what's he up to at the moment? I can't really remember. Wait, what? What's Ben up to this year? I can't even remember. Oh, so he, last year he tried to do super bikes, but he had an issue with sponsorships. I think they dropped out like after the third race. So he dropped back down to super stock on the thousand. This year oh. he's doing full super bikes. He's got a big sponsor. I don't know who it is, but um, yeah, he's been training hard. He's been riding well. His bike looks really good. So, uh, He's definitely going to come out wanting to fight this year for sure. But then again, the names coming out in Superbikes, this is going to be a stacked year for sh- for starters. I'm like, yeah, it's going to, I've got, I've got some work to do for sure. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Um, well, yeah, it was, I think it's Stefano Mesa as well. I think I'm almost certain it was Mesa. I've just Googled it. Uh, okay. Yeah. No, Mesa. Yeah. On the Kawasaki as well. He was, yeah, he was doing really good there too. It probably yeah. was. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, going on to the superbike grid that you mentioned, it's. But this is also something I want to talk about. It's stacked this it year's superbike grid, um, but, and you got a superbike cup in there as well. Yeah, which obviously makes it even harder because you're battling against 
like Nolan Lamkin and stuff who are on a stock bike but can still somewhat contend against the yeah, stock bike. Yeah, I mean, he's on a stock BMW and like, yeah, there's some things he can't do, but those BMWs power to power wise, even stock ones are fast as anything. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's going to be interesting. But yeah, I mean, we've got Loris Baz is coming back. This year, mm. he knows the tracks and he's got all the data from uh, Josh Herrian and Petrucci and everything. So he was nearly winning without that stuff. It was very make or break. He'd either get close to winning or unfortunately crash out because he was pushing so hard. Yeah. Then you've got Sean Dylan Kelly, who I've never really seen him on a thousand. But I mean, they're not the thousand super bikes aren't that much faster than the moto two bikes so no that it's going to be similar so he's going to be fighting then josh heron's coming back obviously he's been on that ducati now this will be his second year so he'll be ready to go you've got cameron bobier coming back this year who he won a lot of races and had a challenge gagne for a while but he had some really unfortunate incidents you know mm. um with that you've got jd beach coming back who he was doing flat track a lot but i mean he came back and put it on the podium he's really really fast oh, known he won as well didn't he last year yeah he won a race exactly he <laughs> came back hadn't ridden in like two years comes back gets podium and then wins a race um and he's now on a bmw with titler and we know those bikes are rocket ships cam mm. peterson had a lot of injuries last year and he's finally overcome them and i mean he won the stock uh 1000 class i think three years ago and yeah. dude's fast as anything so um it's yeah i mean i'm, I'm sure i'm missing some people too you miss jake gagne <laughs> oh yeah I, I, don't, I don't even need to mention jake gagne yeah, that goes without saying knows. doesn't it <laughs> dude jake gagne I, no words for that guy he's phenomenal he's like literally the level. coolest dude in the paddock he's so chill talk to anyone he's in flip-flops half the time just chilling and dude when he gets on a bike dude he's crazy he's crazy good i'm not gonna lie yeah. so and this is what his he's won it three years in a row now yeah he has yeah so this will yeah. be going for his fourth in a row and mm. uh i mean i he's the guy to beat you know <laughs> like, he's he's untouchable really like i still remember when he absolutely demolished everybody in loris baz's year and he yeah. won like he won all races but four something like that yeah he went on a winning streak for like a long 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 time i think <laughs> his he broke in the first race then he won like every single race until mm. like near the end where something happened but yeah no he 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 was unstoppable i mean him that team that bike they know exactly what to do. They've got the data. They've got everything they need. So it's up to Gagne to stick it out there and win the race. And he's really good at it. So. Yeah, he is. And then you've got, obviously, Brandon Past. You've got Escalante in there as well. And... Yeah, Escalante. And then um, you've got Brandon Past is coming out. He was injured a bit last year. And you saw him fighting through the field. Mm. Um, you got Ben Smith coming back this year. Obviously, you got the Nolan Lampkin will be out there on in the on a stock bike. Then I heard, I think it was, um, I don't know if they're doing it. There was a stock class of Orange Cat with Travis Wyman and uh, I think it was Jason Uribe. I don't know mm. if they're doing the I super saw that. bike as yeah. well. I think it's, they're doing the stock, but I'm not sure if they're doing the cup. Yeah, exactly. So I'm not sure about that. But last year, those bikes were really quick. And mm. Jason Uribe was doing World Superbikes. Was it two years ago or last year? Yeah, he, he stepped in for uh, on the Pedicini bike. Not yeah, the so, year before, yeah. I mean, you learn a lot riding with those guys. So mm. who knows what they're bringing to the table now. So, yeah, lots of big names. You know, it's a lot of good people. Um I don't know if Gillum's going to be riding in Superbike Cup either on the Honda. He's in the stock, isn't he? But yeah, I'm not sure if he'll do the Superbike Cup, maybe. Yeah, it's weird because like, I haven't been to a race yet. So it's like I need to see it, who's where doing what and everything. Yeah, but and how it it's goes. Gonna be good. Where do you see yourself in that? Because obviously we've just listed a load of top names. Some of them which you did beat in the championship last year. Yeah. <laughs> where do you see yourself in that? Because you're, from my understanding, pretty much like a self-funded team it's not got the big sponsors it's not got the big money in it's kind of 
obviously we'll tell me you tell me about the Pedro Costa story in a little bit that will help back up what I'm trying to say <laughs> here about you know kind of how your team run. Yeah, I mean, we are. <laughs> We are a team that honestly just strictly love motorcycle racing. It's uh, it's funded by mainly one guy, which his name's Tim uh, Ivanov. He works where I'm at right now. Uh, Arrow Aviation is a big helicopter company in Louisiana. And um, I met him. We actually got our racing license together. He was, I think, 60 and I was 12. That's and cool. um, we got our licenses together. And as I was racing, doing like the younger classes, we just run into each other every now and then. Um, and back when they were racing the Harley XR 1200s, he offered me a ride, um, on it because their rider was unable to do so. And I finished the best that bike had finished all year. So they're like, Hey, let's start a team XR 1200s. The next year XR 1200s were done. So like, Oh, well let's go into stock 1000. So it started there, but yeah, I mean, to put it into perspective, you know, our team, our budget each year is like $250,000, which sounds like a lot, you know, you could get a nice house for that, but like the, we're up against teams. I mean, Yamaha, Ducati, Titlers, they were 5 million plus last year. They are, I mean, the guys have already been testing. They've been riding um, all the tracks in California. They've been doing everything they can do. They're prepping their bikes they've got the best of the best stuff you know and uh we've just been kind of working like we can't throw all the money into the bike in one year because then we can't get to the races we Mm. can't go out and buy uh an 18 wheeler big toy hauler thing so we look all fat like posh because then we don't have money for the bike so it's like very little things like we get a truck and then we race that year and then we get this part for the bikes and we race that year and it keeps kind of going through that this year though it has to be the bike's going to be the best it's ever been. I'm very happy with what's going on. Um, we finally, we've never ran with suspension data. Um, it's always been my mouth. So when I'm talking to Olin's, which they help us out at every event, they're great people, but they're so used to looking at the computer, seeing what's happening in the track. And when I come in, I'm like in turn four, it's chattering and I'm running wide. And like, they can't see anything because we didn't have anything to show them. So they just had to kind of guess. And they, there was a lot of guesswork with us. So it took us more time to figure it out than the top teams. So mm. with the suspension data this year, we have a new suitor swing on, which has way more custom ability. And we have this new um, program where we can put in all of our adjustments and it will tell us what's going to happen to the bike and this, which we've never had before. Um, our electronics are still a step behind the top guys for sure. Um, they've mm. been getting better and better, but we just can't afford the top stuff. Like, um, they can tune the bike for like every five yards of the track. So as they're coming through a corner, if it, your bike's going to wheelie super hard out of that corner, they can put extra wheelie control in just for that corner. But the next corner, that wheelie control could be completely out and they give max power where I have to kind of go in the middle because, I want the wheelie control here, but I don't want it in that corner. So you kind of go for the middle or which is going to give you the best track time because I can only tune the bike for the whole track. So that's a big thing, you know, tire life and everything like that. So it's still going to be difficult. But in this class, I know that I know that I can do well. I'm not saying I have the best equipment, but like I know what I can do. And with the bike getting better each year. I mean, I've beaten some guys and then they've been given opportunities and now they're like finishing in the top five. Like mm. Brandon Posh a year before, me and him were battling back and forth a lot. Then he got a super bike ride and he was in the top five in a couple races. And I'm like, what the heck? So I was like, yeah. I've, I feel like I've got the talent those guys do. It's just catching up with everything else. Yeah, it's just about having the package underneath you. And I think having the right package and the right bike, the right team around you, can shave a second off your lap time really like we saw cam peterson's a great example because he was great on that suzuki when he joined the superbike class and he was impressive he was up there and he was the odd podiums and stuff like that switches onto that attack yamaha and he's up there every Every race every weekend he's there yeah it's it, it definitely helps when when you have a team that knows what they're doing and they have it set up and they you come in and kind of hop on, do what you can, and then they go, we'll take care of the rest. Is really, really cool. Like, 
I haven't got there yet, but I'm sure it's really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You'll get there. You'll get there. I mean, what? tell me about the story of Pedro Costa that happened last year. Because I saw it on your <laughs> Instagram stories. And yeah, because... it was um, it was really funny because uh, uh, our truck broke down. Um, it had the oil pickup tube in the bottom of the motor broke. And uh, we, I was stuck in Alabama for like a week. The, the place we went, the, they were like, oh, yeah, um, it'll be done tomorrow. It wasn't done. Oh, it'll be done tomorrow. It wasn't done. It just oh. kept going. And then we were like five days away from um, Moto, uh, Moto America with Moto GP. And I was like, I need my truck. And they're like, it's not going to be done. So my photographer actually came. He had, it was, it was probably eight by eight by five trailer, just like something you put a lawnmower on or something. Like it was, I, I, it, it was bad. He shows mm. up. I'm like, okay. He goes, and he's in a Mazda to pull it. And I'm like, okay. So we, we put two bikes, two toolboxes, three, um, three canopies and as many spare parts as we could fit and the spare rims close this trailer up. It's an open trailer. And then we drive straight through the night to uh kota and it was like a 12 hour drive oh, so um i drove six hours jeff drove six hours and we get there and we park up we're both falling asleep i posted a video of us next to the 18 wheelers because it was honestly it looked like a joke and as we were pulling in obviously all the 18 wheelers are you know all the pods that the motor gp stuff coming in and then i pull in with this mazda with two yellow yamahas on the back and as we do it we stop and Pedro Acosta's coming in on his, uh, no, in a, uh, the shuttle that was there. And him and his team just look over and see what we're pulling in with. And they all just start laughing. They, they like, <laughs> honestly couldn't contain it. They were laughing like, what the heck is this? Is this a what joke? Is like, what's going on? And we looked at them and we said, hey, man, we're doing good. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was definitely an experience. <laughs> but, hey, man, to make Pedro Acosta laugh. That's, that's an honor saying how good he's doing this year. So. Oh, yeah. He is the man in everybody's mouth at the moment, Pedro Costa. So. Yeah, after that last race, I mean, he passed some people. He passed them hard and he made it stick. And the way he was <laughs> drifting that bike, that was like it's the terrible. trust he had in the front cor- uh, on the front tire was insane. He felt mm. something that no one else felt really on that track for sure. Yeah, it's actually terrifying to watch him race a motorbike at the moment, knowing he's only 19 years old as well. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's absolutely insane. But hey, man, I hope I hope he still uh, keeps kicking butt. But if he laughs at me again, I'm going to have to beat him on the track. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take out for a track day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he can only ride what maybe that KTM 800, was it the RC8R? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll get him have, on the 1,000. Yeah, he'll smash yeah. him. Easy. <laughs> Yeah, it's it is interesting because they have obviously last few years, Kota MotoGP round has been coincided with the Superbike event from Moto America, the opening round. Yeah, and this year I believe it is not the Superbike, but the Baggers. Is that right? Yeah, so it's only the Baggers. We're the only class going to the Kota round. Right, and because. You can do multiple classes in Moto America, which I kind of like. So you see a lot of the baggers riders riding superbikes and vice versa. Obviously, you're doing superbike and baggers this year. And that's pretty cool that we get to see the baggers at Kota for one. Yeah. Because <laughs> the baggers are epic. And I absolutely <laughs> love them. But am I right in saying you're doing three races? You're doing two six lap races and then one two lap scrap for the dash. Is that right? Yeah. Scrap for the so... dash, scrap for the cash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happens is we do a qualifying race and uh, um, not race, a qualifying session. And whoever's in the top six, they do this event called the Dash Recast. It's mm. uh, pretty much you go out, whoever wins the race walks away. I think it was with five grand. So it's like it's a it's a very short race. It's like two yeah. laps at Kota. Yeah. I'm not even it might be one. I'm not sure. That's wild. But it's really short. But it's just like I don't know. It's I feel like it's the American way, you know, like, hey, look, it's like a showdown, you know, we're going to take the top six guys, just put them on the track real fast, two laps, really exciting, whoever wins gets five grand, you know, and uh, it's always a good show for sure, but um, 
yeah, so we do that one, but not everyone's in that. And then we have the two six lap races. But I'm not fully sure if that's going to be the case with MotoGP because mm. um, obviously Dorna's in control and they're going to be doing their own thing. So I'm not sure if that's going to happen. Um, I don't, I'm not even sure if we have two races. I'm, I'm assuming we do, mm. but I haven't seen a schedule yet. It came out very late this year and my team was like, I don't even know if we're going to make it. And I was like, oh, okay. I was like, I'd really like to because it's yeah. MotoGP. You know, MotoGP. like one, you get free tickets to MotoGP and then two, I get to perform in some of the, in front of the, some of the greatest riders in the world. And yeah. I guarantee they're going to want to watch the baggers because it's they're gonna love so it. different. It's so yeah. different. So It's wild. Like, yeah, I think we just love the baggers. We had Carl Wyman on there a little while ago, talk about yeah. the baggers and stuff after he'd won his title there. And they're just epic. You know, Jeremy Williams going on it the last few years. It's been really cool. And you've got, obviously, Troy Herfoss has jumped over from Australia. Yeah, he did with the extremely Indian well in... Uh, at Daytona. At Daytona, oh. he was flying, so... Yeah, so, obviously, you as a superbike rider, you're doing the baggers as well, which mm. is... A completely different bike to ride yeah. in terms of like the riding style and stuff like that. Yet you kind of hit in similar lap times as a superbike. And so, yeah, what's the it's biggest not, difference? <laughs> it's not that far off. It's very strange because, like, yeah. the first time I got on it, I was like, "Whoa, this is strange." And everyone was telling me about, "Oh, watch the lean angle, watch the lean angle." But after you get used to them, dude, you can throw these things down like mm. pretty hard to the floor and they just stick because they've got so much weight on them. But that is the biggest difference is the weight. Like I'm not going as fast on the bagger, but I used the nearly identical braking markers because mm. you're going a little bit of a slower speed, but instead of having 300 pounds to stop, you've got 650 pounds to stop. So like you just on the brakes at the same time, the oddest thing for me is you'll you go from having like this tucked in elbows in kind of knee down uh, on the ground position to this like arms up kind of floating in the air knee down like more like old school riding style um, on the bagger. So switching those is a bit different, and then also remembering my gear changes is really difficult sometimes. I'll go into a corner and like. On the super bike, it'll be three down. So I'll bang, 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 and I'm into the corner. Everything's good. And on the bagger, it's only two. So All if right. you go three, one, there's a great chance you might blow the thing up because they, I mean, these things, they, they are now built to race, but they're not built to race, you know? They're so, not built to be hammered. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're supposed to keep them a little bit more lower in the RPM and stuff. So remembering that, or, you know, some other times I only go one down on the uh, Superbike and I go two down on the bagger and I'll forget. And if you don't have the engine braking with the bagger, you you're not making the corner. Like you can't slow the thing down enough. So mm. it's it that will throw me off a couple times. So I have gotten really good to counting like my downshifts and stuff. But other than that, they're very similar. The you ride the bagger a little bit more like a six hundred though. It's more flowy and stuff. But the torque on the things speed. is very one thousand like bang it's right there so it took me a minute but now that i got used to it oh dude i love it and i love that i get more track time i get to ride more it's 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 so fun it's a great time yeah <laughs> and you get to ride against riders that you wouldn't normally ride against because there are a few that also do different class same classes like hayden gillen for example who's champion last year but riders like tyler o'hara who really only specializes in the baggers and the the hooligans doesn't he you don't really see him on the 600s yeah. or 1000s and so to go up against him is a different one yeah it's really cool to see him for sure out there i've raced with him once or twice in the but he only does like one-offs really he did the daytona 200 a couple times on a 600 hmm. but yeah racing against tyler look tyler's a super cool guy he's open you know I, I like riding against him he's very flat track too so you see him just squirrely on the bike and then obviously racing with jeremy mcwilliams dude it's a legend yeah and he he's is. kicking butt i mean the way he slid that indian last year at brainerd that was insane. I was like, there's yeah. no way he saved that. So it's really cool riding against these guys. And then I feel like um, the baggers, it's a little bit more of an even playing field because there's not as much electronics on the bike. So yeah. especially when I'm in front of the guys, I mean, last year, I some of my qualifyings, I was qualifying in the top five. I was beating these guys. So like 
if, if it definitely is a confidence booster once you've been on the super bike and you're kind of getting beat up on by all these guys with just bigger budgets and more electronics than you and then you get back on the bagger and it kind of you know i've still got this you know like i'm still kicking these guys butts i'm one of the fastest people out here i mean and it's not like it's it's not like it's not a stacked class i mean you got Corey west's out there he's ex-champion you know jake lewis is out there he's an ex-champion you've mm -hmm. got um you got troy coming over from australia you know kyle wyman he's won in the superbike class i've been racing him since i started travis wyman he's been in the he's been in the championship fight in stock 1000s i think every year for the last like three years i mean the guys that are in the class are really good riders so to be up there with them is it's awesome well you're up there and you're also beating them. You got your podium, didn't you? <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> the first I was, ever Miss uh, America podium. Yeah, that was my first one uh, ever. It was my second trophy with uh, Motor America because the year before I got Sportsman of the Year, which was kind of uh, yeah. cool. I, I, I enjoyed that. that a lot, but um, it was really nice that I got noticed for it, but it wasn't a racing win. So it was still difficult. Um, but no, that podium was unreal, man. It was. Uh, it was a tough race. It was wet, dry. Um, I was slipping all over the place. I actually came from 11th to get third. Uh, they only started kind of showing it on the TV when I was in fifth. But I fought past Jake Lewis. I fought past McWilliams. I fought past Bobby. I fought past a lot of people <laughs> to get to where I was. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I've been in the paddock since Motor America started. I've got tons of fans. I've got some real loyal people, even like the Motor America crew that work, like the marshals, corner workers, everything. They were all cheering. A lot of people said it was one of their favorite races of the whole year, which was really cool. And then just to be on that podium, just like to prove, hey, I've still got this. I'm, I, 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 I'm a good rider. I can do this. Just give me the opportunity. That was really, really nice. And then having, you know, everyone there, my mom, and sister came to the race and my dad mm. was there so like everyone was just in tears and the owner of the team brandon he was just like hey man if we can get top tens this year that's awesome and to put it on the podium i don't think he ever believed it and he was in emotional wreck so yeah it was <laughs> it was it was super special for me and like i said even the commentator said it wasn't like i was given it no one crashed no one really broke the only position I really got in that race was when Rispoli went off track. Um, mm. Other than that, I passed everyone fair and square, and I burnt my tire out so fast that the last couple laps, I was just holding on. I was like, don't you crash now. Don't you do it. And uh, honestly, I wanted to go for number one spot, but yeah, I was just thinking to myself, I didn't want to be that guy who you've all we've all seen them, the guys who go out in the rain and they go from like 15th to third and they're like, I'm going to win this. And they crash because they push too hard. I didn't want to be mm. that guy. I wanted to be the guy who brought it home for the team, for me and everyone and be on the podium. And like I said, it was, I was speechless. Still one of the best moments in my life. Uh, I'm hoping to get more podiums this year, fingers crossed, but maybe in front of the MotoGP guys, that'd be pretty cool, you know, but that would <laughs> we'll be see. Epic. Well, you get to share, do you get the same like podium area? Uh, for the MotoGP this year because I think last year you had it was different where you didn't actually go on the official podium you kind of had a little one off the side is that right or yeah we have our own one because to get us through all the media things it gets very complicated but I have no idea I've this like I said us showing up with MotoGP it was very last minute so I don't know how anything's going to be set up. All I know is I've got to be there in two weeks and <laughs> I've got to be ready to go. Definitely so, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I, I don't know. Hopefully if, if we do get to share a podium, that'd be really, really cool. I think, I think that's the way to do it. Mm. But if not, Hey man, I'll take a podium any day. So. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, like that podium, I remember it seen it all on social media because we can't really watch the baggers over here, which is quite frustrating. Because I would love to watch more of the baggers because they are epic. Yeah. But yeah, I remember social media just going mental when you got that podium because I always hear it that you're like the most well loved guy in that paddock. Everybody <laughs> absolutely adores you. And obviously, you won the Sportsman of the Year thing as well. And you always hear stuff on social media about you 
like where I'm, you know, they're like, oh, he's always got time for the fans and stuff like that. So I think to get that podium, I think for a lot of people was just like a, yeah, the nice guy finally wins kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, it was it was like the nice guy that didn't finish last this time. It was cool. Mm. So like that, and then also you know when we're a privateer bagger team, we're going up against factory, factory team. Harley, factory Indian, Vance and Hines. Like these are not like small money people at all. So I think everyone is like David and Goliath too. And yeah, everyone's been rooting for me for so long. They're like, hey, like we know you're going to get there and for it to finally happen was cool. I mean, afterwards, I normally I go straight to the paddock, get undressed and everything. I think I was in my leathers for like two hours after the podium, like with people just running up to me and like hugging me. I had like 60 phone calls from people crying on the phone. Like I had like fans in California, like sending me pictures of them crying. And I'm like, Oh my it word. was, um, it, it was, it was, it was, it was really special. Um, I've I've been in the paddock so long. Like I said, I I try not to burn any bridges or say anything bad against anyone. Like when the fans come, I always like try to make time for them because hey man, they're watching us and like that's what's paying us, you know? Like without them, we're not going to be racing. So I think the fans are very important and I'd always try my best to like, you know, take pictures with kids on the bike or you know, I've crashed a couple times and I'll give the kid my helmet or, no you know, way. like people will come over and just like, they want to talk. And I'm like, yeah, come look, like, come look at the bike. What do you want to know? Like this. So, um, also I try to go out before every race and say good luck to all the riders, obviously besides the ones I'm in, but mm. like, you know, the junior cup, those kids are coming up. They're going to be doing Superbike one year you know like also it gets your name known through the paddock you know they see your face you say good luck some people said hey man thank you so much for getting saying good luck i was so nervous until you came and talked to me so oh. i i just i don't know I, racing's like it's one of the biggest loves in my life and if i can make it a good experience for everyone i'm gonna try my best to do that so yeah like it's genuinely like really nice i think because racing at times can be a pretty savage and brutal sport Yes. When it's not going your way, you know, and your engine's blown up and you, you have to go home early because you can't afford to do the rest of the weekend or the results aren't coming and you're worried about paying your bills because you need, you know, the prize money to pay the bills or you need this, that and the other. And I think some people just need that, you know, that pat on the back or that right. little bit of motivation and stuff like that. So it is genuinely really nice that it is something that you go and do. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of people appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. I wouldn't. I wouldn't change it. Like I said, if I can just make someone's day a little bit better and they race a little bit better, then hey, hey man, I'm gonna do it. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> respect, I respect it. I've got a few questions for you now. Of course. Um, obviously, because I need to ask questions anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you could race for any team besides your own team, that is on the superbike grid, which team would it would you pick and why? Kind of which bike of the lot would you pick as well um ah that'd be tough um honestly i'd probably go with the tech yamaha i'm not gonna okay. lie um those guys i've met the crew i know who runs it um and th they're just they're always on point they just got it got it got it got it got it um i've been on yamaha so long it'd be very like it would be so easy to switch over um i mean the titlers bmw guys that their team is epic they've come in and you know they're doing really really well um i just i don't know if i'd get along with the bmw because i've heard i've seen how you have to ride them and i'm more of a smooth rider i mm -hmm. like to hit the corners and get through and get on the gas where the bmw looks very point and shoot like get in get out get in get out um yeah. I mean, I know how good the Ducati is. If I was going to pick a bike, I'd probably pick the Ducati because, you know, you've seen what Bautista's been able to do on it for the last two, three years. So that seems like the bike to do it. Um, I've just never ridden one, so it's I, it's hard to say because I know, obviously, Ducatis suit different riders. You know, you've seen people jump over to Ducati and not do well because it doesn't suit them. But then you've got people like Bautista, like Chaz Davis, like – um all these Probably guys coming the over yeah. yeah so i mean they, they're doing really well so i it's hard i would pick yamaha because that's what i know and i know how good the attack yamaha team is but 
I would love to have a go on the Ducati just to see if I got along with it because I know yeah. how good those bikes are overall. So I don't know. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a good question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Because I mean, the power those the cat is punching out as well is obscene. Even like the super bikes are pushing probably 250 brake horsepower. Yeah. I mean, I was, isn't that close? But yeah, no, the, the Ducati's BMWs, they're definitely up. I, I would say 240 to 250 easily. Hmm. It's so, unbelievable. I think because you mentioned about the going going for Yamaha to the BMW, and obviously Top Rack did that last year. And I remember him saying about how differently you had to ride the thing. Yeah, obviously there's a lot more power, which he appreciated. But yeah, it's it can be hard, especially as a smooth rider, to then go to a bike that does require you to just absolutely send, send it. it in there. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. honestly, when I heard of Top Rack moving to bmw i honestly did think it would be a good move for him because everyone knows how legendary he is on the brakes mm. and cameron bobier came last year and he was like the hardest thing on the bmw was getting the thing stopped he goes just getting it into the corner and getting the thing stopped he goes power wise there's no issues mm. so with the power to not get blasted to the line every time by a ducati <laughs> and his braking capabilities i honestly I, I was all for it for him i was like that mm. sounds like a great time and obviously after this last race uh he's uh he's figuring it out you know? oh, did you see that overtake the last oh, corner it, it was, <laughs> yeah yeah it's crazy i mean i've watched him battle that ducati and it was very similar to what we were saying before with sean dylan kelly and richie escalante the battles mm. was bautista would come back and top rack had to attack if he didn't get him then it was over and that's what he did. And the racing was so good. So now that he can do it and stay in front, he is top contender for this year. I mean, obviously, Bautista's not out the window because he's absolutely amazing on the Ducati. But it's going to make a, it's gonna make an interesting race. I think Superbike's one of my favorite races to watch at the moment. So. Yeah, I agree. I love the Superbike. A, pretty mo a bit more than MotoGP, to be honest. I think... I like the MotoGP. I love the guys in it. It's just very... Ducati, 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 which is no problem. I mean, they've put in the work. They've had, what, six, seven, eight bikes there the last three years, just development, 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 and now they're winning all the time. It's like, hey, mm. that's what development gets you, where, you know, you have some other teams that have had great bikes and they haven't done the development as much with, like, Honda and Yamaha, and, like, now they're struggling and they're working really hard on development, but they still don't have eight bikes there, like, eight loads of, like, development like from eight different riders there's so much information that you can work with when if you're just using two and half the time the guy's not happy or crashing you know it's it must be really difficult so oh yeah especially well you probably experienced it yourself because you're you're a one-man band really you don't have a teammate or anything it's just you you're yeah. relying on your data you go on track because you're a private yamaha as well so it's not like you've got access to the attack performances data and stuff like that yeah, and even, basically on you. Yeah, even if we did too, it's like our data isn't comparable because they have different things. So mm. yeah, I mean, when Westby was in it, unfortunately not in it, they did share some stuff with us, but it, like it, it just wasn't comparable because they had just slightly better things here, slightly better things there. Their electronic guy wasn't really used to what we were running, so it's just it's difficult. But yeah, when you have a teammate and you've got two loads of data coming in like i said you're gonna have the ducatis this year josh and loris those guys gonna be feeding off each other i think that's gonna be a great duo so that's gonna help out but yeah when you have somebody else to push you because you know the first person you want to beat is your teammate so mm. if they can do it and they're on the same bike as you you can do it so to have someone like that and go in like that it's it's definitely helpful for sure yeah i would agree i think it just just helps to maybe reconfirm things that you're struggling with the bike potentially and also maybe find a way around a solution that maybe you hadn't even thought about you know maybe oh you know break a little bit later here but don't go down as many gears or something like that just to, right right to, right treat just, the suspension two clicks and exactly it definitely helps i mean you, i think girl off said it the best you know my bike won but i i wasn't on it um mm. about the world superbike i mean now he knows he's got a bmw that can win and that's going to light a fire under his butt to get back up there and do something. Because last year, I mean, he was him. Uh, he was uh, 
mainly the top BMW, you know, writing would take it sometimes and that and Lars would take it other times, but he was up there a lot. So to now have this BMW with top rack on it, just uh, up there and then Vandermark's also doing pretty well on it. But like, um, it's going to be, yeah, it just makes you want to ride harder and push a little bit more and like, I can do it too, you know? Yeah, it's a bit motivating, isn't it? Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So another question for you, because I've seen a lot of riders, and this year the grid is obscene. <laughs> Probably even more obscene than the Superbike in some areas. But Super Sport Class in Moto America, everyone's going there. PJ's there this year, Corey Alexander's there. You've got, obviously, Javi Forres was there last year. Josh Herring was there. Stefano Mays was there a bit as well. Like There are so many riders in that Super Sport Class this year. One, why are they going there? And two, is it of interest to you as well? So I believe, unfortunately, like we were talking about before, it is such a cutthroat industry. And super bikes, you need a full team and you need like, you need the backing to be in those top positions. And mm. with the people that are in super bikes this year and the teams that are there, if you want to compete, sometimes it's just better to go into a different class. So, I mean, unfortunately, Corey with Titlers, even though Corey helped build the team, they had to, I don't know what happened, but Corey's now riding with uh, Reynold with PJ and Kayla. And this team came in, I think they came in and they didn't want to jump straight into Superbikes. They want to come mm. in and kind of dip their feet, go into a class, get three solid riders, and go out and see what they can do. I think it's a great choice, to be honest. You know, it's like, hey, if we go straight into Superbikes and we don't do well because these other teams are already killing it, um, you know, uh, it's not going to look that good. But if we go into 600s and we're finishing the top three and we've got these good riders, you know, then we can see what we can do next year. Um, and obviously, you, a lot of racers go where the paychecks are. I don't know who's paying what, but like, hey, if I got paid more money to ride in the 600 class, I'd be there. You know, like mm. it's it's just uh, the brutal honesty of it. Everyone's looking for that paycheck. Um, unfortunately, racing in America isn't as big as it is in Europe. So the paychecks aren't as high over here. A lot of riders are riding for free or some of them are even paying. So mm. it's, uh, it's definitely tougher over here for sure. But hey, if they're paying in that class and it is so competitive, I mean, if you win the 600 class, you're, you're doing something right. I mean, it's not a slouch. You got Tyler Scott, who's a young guy coming up. He's killing it super fast. You got T Hobbs, who is, he lives up near me with New Hampshire and uh, he's extremely fast. Um, Then you've got Matthew. You got Blake Davis has just stepped up and he's won the championship twice in twins. So, mm. I mean, I've seen him ride a 600 and he, he suits that bike and riding style perfectly. You've mm. got Matthew Skultz going on a 600 this year, <laughs> yeah. um, which I've raced against Matthew for a long time. And that dude is ridiculously good. I, I watch him all the time and the, how hard he will push a bike is insane. I don't know if he's got the right bike. I wouldn't want to be on a 600 Yamaha in that class per se. But if anyone can win on it, it's going to be him. So, I mean, yeah, the class is, it's tight. I mean, Superbike and 600s are going to be, I feel like we're going to have some of the best racing this year, overall racing, um, with everything from baggers to Superbike to 600s to all the classes. Um I don't know if I would go back. It would be one of those things. If I got the opportunity and the pay and everything and it all kind of went together and it was a really good team because I wouldn't want to go in that team to finish mid-pack, you know, like it's not what I want to do. Um, I might, but with my team in the super bikes, I mean, we get the most TV coverage. We get the most time on track. We, I'm riding with the best riders in America and some of the ones around the world. Mm-hmm. um and i'm just so used to it if my team was like hey let's go back to 600s it'd be like restarting and i'd be like no let's not do it like um but i don't know i just got so used to the r1 now and the power and everything like i, I don't know how i'd fare on a 600 anymore no it's, it's weird because you do see 
like Josh Herring when he went back to 600 for me was a big shock because he's so used to 1000s you know he was a superbike champion back in 2013 I think it was he won the stock 1000s and he won all that and then to hop back to a yeah it was a 990c twin so it's a little bit different to an R6 but yeah it did make me wonder because the electronics are obviously a lot more restricted in there mm-hmm. you don't really have access to the ones that you'll have for example so it would be weird like how for you obviously with your experience how would you have to ride a 600 differently to what you would have 1000 you have to so the 1000s is very i still kind of ride it smooth but it's more point and shoot you want to get into the corner as fast as you can get the bike turned as fast as you can and you want to get out as fast as you can because you know that power is going to carry you out the corner with a 600 you um way more flowy so that you really just want to carry the corner speed and you want to get on the gas as early as possible but it's not you don't want to slow the bike down too much going into the corner to turn it to get it out because you don't have that power to get out the corner like the thousand does you Mm. kind of want to run the corner as fast as you possibly can right on the edge and just use that momentum to carry you onto the next straightaway to push down the corner so you would change it up a little bit more. Um, you can still break later on the 600s because they're lighter and they're not going as fast, but you'll see a lot more people like they'll drift into the corner and then just kind of let off the brake instead of slowing it down to hit that apex perfectly. They'll just let off the brake, run the corner and just get straight back on the gas to carry that momentum. And it's, yeah. it's a bit different. It's like, obviously they can do it because they're a bit lighter and they can really run the corner. But um it is a different riding style for sure, where you're not just picking up the bike and getting on the gas as hard as you can. Yeah, it's more of like carrying the momentum, isn't it, through the corner? Exactly, and exactly. The corner speed. Remind me, did you do the Daytona on the 600 this year? I did not do it this year. Unfortunately, last... I, I I don't have the bike for it. I have right. a 600 at my house, and it's a 2008 Yamaha. I mean, it's Ooh. an old school Yamaha. I think it has a 2013 motor in it. But it's old school. It's I've done the Daytona on it, and I actually beat um, Dunlop when he came over. That was no the last way. time I did. I, that was the last time I did it, and I finished epic. tenth. And Dunlop was eleventh. I beat him in yeah. qualifying and the race, so it was really oh, cool. Because um, I he's a legend, so I was like, oh, this yeah. is crazy. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, Daytona is a track that if you don't have the power, you're not gonna win. And I've never had the power there. I've I've been good in the infield and I've been good through the chicane. But if you don't have the power, you can't. Last time I was there, I think my bike was doing about 168. And this year they're re- hitting 180. And it's just, it's, it's just not comparable. Like you've been on the, uh, the motorway where a car comes past you at 90 and you're doing 80. And it's yeah, like, it's boom, so they're gone. So if they're doing nearly, you know, 12 mile an hour faster than me. It's just... The lap time's not there. My bike's yeah, not there. So no. unless somebody came with me and they were like, hey, here's a bike. It's fast. Go ride it. I I just, I wouldn't be able to enter it again. Yeah, that makes sense. I was going to ask how much of like a, how mental it is in your brain to be doing the baggers and then the 600 <laughs> in the same weekend. That would be, that would be really interesting to be honest because you're going from something that's so heavy to something that's so light and nimble. Like, I feel like I'd go off the inside of the track on the 600. <laughs> yeah, you'd be like, oh, yeah, this is my breaking marker. Right. Not... <laughs> but um, no, I, I don't know. I would love to. I, I love riding the 600. It's such a fun time. But yeah, no, I don't have the bike for it. And then to run like a really good 600 cost nearly the same as running a really good thousand so it's mm. not in the not in the works for sure <laughs> no yeah i think the superbike program's a bit better i think i obviously don't know too much about it i think you get a bit more money as well on superbike from the championship yeah you can like uh from the championship you get a bit more money in your pocket and then um you know it's just it's it's more about the tv time the, uh racing mm. is a huge part of it is sponsors and that you're on tv more they do more coverage with you and all that that's better for us because we can take that to our sponsors and say hey look we get this 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 and this and everything like that so it's more helpful in that way too yeah absolutely absolutely another question <laughs> i'm on it uh, doing like quick fire ones now because it's nearly end of the hour 
All right, I'll uh, keep it short. Got... That's all right. It's all right. I don't mind if we go over, we go over. I mean, I've got time. I don't know about yourself, but <laughs> but obviously you run with the number 88. Is there any reason for that? Um, n- Not really, to be honest. I started racing in England and my dad, we sat down and he goes, hey, what race number do you want to be? And I'm like, I don't know. And he goes, how about eight? And I was like, okay. And that was it. Was like, it. <laughs> I picked eight. I had eight all through my championships in England. I had, and then I came to America and someone had my number already. So I went to triple eight and I ran that for a long time. And then Motor America said, hey, if you're in the superbike class, you can't have three digits. It has to be two. So we just knocked an eight off. So it's, I've had eight since I was a kid. So one of my favorites now is very close, uh, similar to you know, the Nikki Hayden uh, saying. It looks the same upside down as it does the right way, yeah. so I never get confused. Um, okay. I've had a lot of people come up to me and tell me how lucky the number is. So that's been like every time someone tells me something nice about it, I'm like, yeah, it's a good number. So yeah, I pick one. And now it's me. You know, it stands out. It's big. It's there. It's nice and round. So uh, it's, it's it's definitely part of who I am now. <laughs> Yeah, I like it. It's a, it's a nice number. I like the because yeah, wasn't it Nikki Hayden said about it? You know, when you crash it, wasn't it? It looks it was a down when you crash. Yeah, if you get hit on the head, you can still see the bike, and it looks the same. So it's yeah, fine. So no it's issue. fine. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously, I think it's probably to do maybe a bit of team time, but bright yellow for your motorbike. <laughs> yeah, um, the guy who owns the team, Tim, uh, he used to race Buells, and he had an 1125 Buell with a super bike motor, and its thing was insane. It was so mm. big, but it took off. And he always had them yellow, and uh, he says he liked them yellow because when um, he was on track, you could always see him. You, you knew where it is. You know, a lot of these teams, they go, like, especially in, like, the bagger team class now, there's so many black bikes in there that you just mm. can't really tell who's who. So when I come through on a bright yellow bike, it's like, that's Max. So it's more okay. about getting my name out there. And then also uh, at the helicopter company that sponsors me, they paint a lot of helicopters yellow. So there's always yellow left in the, the spray gun. So they'll <laughs> go out and they'll just spray the bodywork. And you're like, hey, it's done. So we get a nice paint job for it. And uh, I said it stands out. It's I think it's definitely part of me now because when I joined the bagger team, they're like, we're going to paint it yellow. And I was like, you don't have to. Like, I'm like, we have everything yellow over here, but you don't have to do it if you don't want to. He goes, no, we want it yellow too. We want to stand out. I'm like, okay. let's do it. So now the leather's yellow, bike's yellow, helmets are yellow. Yeah, it's like everyone loves it. Even yellow's not even my favorite color, but <laughs> it's it's turning out that way. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite color of interest? um it's actually lime green <laughs> is it nice. yeah I, when i was growing up i raced kawasaki for um when i was six to when i was 12 and i won all my championships on it and uh we had a uh, black with like the lime green monster on it and that was nice. just my favorite color forever and my room was bright green everything was bright green so yellow's not far from it it's, it's yes. close but yeah, yeah, yeah. it's yeah it's it's that's a cool thing for our bike for sure <laughs> yeah absolutely and obviously you're american and british because i believe you hold american citizenship now i do i do <laughs> yes so my question is obviously the americans got america's got a very good national racing series what about british super bikes do you think you'd ever dip your toe in that I would, I would love to. I mean, I've, I've always wanted to go back to England to ride some of the tracks because England's got some of the best tracks. I mean, Silverstone, you've got Cadwell, uh, Cadwell Park, you've got um, Donington Park. I mean, you've got all these great tracks that I would absolutely love to go ride. And to mm. do it with BSB would be phenomenal. Um, it's just all the logistics, like to get yeah. me over there with a bike and a team, get practice and everything. It would be so, so hard. And the, the weirdest thing is, too, um, Taryn McKenzie, um, I, we grew up. Uh, uh, he got taught to ride on the same track I got taught to ride by my oh, dad. Really? Yeah. Um, I know, wild. obviously, Neil McKenzie helped out a lot on that yeah. side and stuff. But um, we grew up in Burton, and uh, there was a track there at a park called Shobnall. And I remember we were riding there and then Neil McKenzie came with his two kids, Taryn and Tyler, and they came on these weird bikes. I don't, they were like 
I don't know what they were, but then dad took them around the track and they were riding with me. And like, it was really cool. Cause my dad was like, you know who this is? And he gave me a story and everything. And then to see, you know, Taryn's riding super bikes and doing really well in BSB mm. for me to be over here doing the same thing. I'm not quite where he's at for sure, but like, it's kind of cool. So for me to go back and like race against him would be kind of awesome in my oh, eyes. Yeah. I don't know if he even remembers me because like I said, it was so long ago and um, everything, but yeah, no, it'd, it'd be really cool. That would be epic. Yeah. Cause I think Taron's up in world to like now, isn't he? He's, um... Did he step up? I, I haven't heard. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cause he won British Superbike a couple of years ago. Yeah. Then moved to, he tried to retain his title, but broke his leg. Then we're yes. at the World Super Sport Net last year, won a race there, and now he's riding the MIE Honda in oh. World Superbike. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, if he ever came back to Britain and you raced him, that would be epic. Because they don't have I electronics so there. Either. I, I love... That would be epic. <laughs> it would be epic. Because, yeah, like I said, they don't have electronics in BSB either. They run very, barely yes. limited ones. <laughs> so, like, yeah, I um, I kind of like that to be honest, because it kind of levels the playing field a little bit. But More about um, talent. yeah, I don't know. Like I said, the logistics to get over there would be ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, it would be absolutely insane. Cause you'd have to do a whole program, a testing program, learn how to ride a super bike without the electronic aids that you've been very used to, and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would be crazy. But honestly, if I could just come to England and hit. Cadwell Park jump, I would I, I would be ecstatic to be honest. I just want yeah. one picture with me sideways just, over yeah. that thing. Yeah. And I would have a great time. <laughs> yeah. Frame it on your wall above a toilet. <laughs> yep. That's all I need. Just that. Yeah. I look at it every day, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be epic. Because we do have some spectacular tracks over here, like your Alton Park, your Cadwell, Snetterton, Broxton. Just brilliant calendar, yeah. but And they're you... so close too. Like mm. here, we have to drive six hours to get to any track. Where there, it's like, oh, hop in the car; it's an hour away. You know? Yeah, like, yeah. I think I'm an hour from Alton Park. It's just up the road from me, Alton Park at the moment. Maybe an hour exactly. and a half. It's just in Chester. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I I would I would love to because like obviously, that's where I grew up, and I always saw those tracks. We went back last year to watch the Silverstone MotoGP race. And uh, me and my sister won like a music game, so we got to go in the paddocks and like see some of the riders and everything. So that was really cool. And mm. uh, but yeah, I mean, just looking at the tracks there, they're amazing. I mean, honestly, America track wise is not anything comparison to English track wise. I mean, they have some spectacular tracks here, like Barber Motorsports is probably the most beautiful track I've ever been to, and then uh, Road America is gorgeous, Laguna Seca is epic, you know. But like, mm. just the you know the standard of English tracks and like, you know, they, they support motorcycles a lot more that I would love to just go be a part of it. It'd be great. Yeah, it would be cool. It would be cool to have you over. I think even just <laughs> for a wild card event, it would be so sick. I would love that for sure. <laughs> yeah, it would be cool. Uh, so the final question of the podcast would be if you could ride any bike ever, at any track ever, what would it be and why? <laughs> big question <laughs> that'd be really hard honestly okay i would take i would ride um wayne rainey's 500 two stroke um, choice. i would ride that and i'd probably take it to i forgot i'm blanking on it the track in australia the bend uh the one philip that... island philip island that's where i'd go sensational choice I'd, I'd, I think that's where I'd go because I've seen the Phillip Island track and how smooth and flowy it is and it just looks so much fun and how fast that first turn is. <laughs> and my dad has always preached to me that the two the two stroke five hundred was the man's bike. Like if you mm. rode that hard, you were a man. And they just look they look deathly, but they look so much fun and how light they were and everything. Um to ride that there and just send it into turn one with like 
oh, I think it would be immense. It would like be life altering. Yeah, literally, I I could I could just walk off the bike and then be done with everything. <laughs> mm. <laughs> or go through was it sail it through te- stone a corner? Yeah, like, sliding then, around. Oh, it would be so fun just drifting the bike and then you know dropping down into it on the brakes. Like yeah. I heard those bikes handled the so good and then mm. yeah i don't know that would be that would be the best thing i could think of i mean obviously you could pick motor gp bikes and everything but i'd, I'd yeah. go old school i think yeah old school is best i think with the two shape <laughs> power bands and yeah the two strokers man smoke behind you freaking awesome smells amazing <laughs> <laughs> i love it when a two stroke goes by and i'm like you just sit there for a minute and just smell the air and you're mm-hmm. like oh. it's it's the best it's the best it yeah i think that would be the best time ever for real yeah brilliant well before we wrap it up i'll ask one more question why not <laughs> what is obviously for superbike and the baggers what are your hopes to achieve this year what are your aspirations do you think you can get that elusive win in the baggers and maybe in the superbikes why not <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> So win in the superbikes would be a tall tale to ask. I mean, that's the class is stacked, and I know what I'm against. Is it possible? Yeah, I I mm. think you know uh, we'd have to have a lot of luck on our side. I have to ride my hardest, and I probably have to have it as a wet race. Um, but if I can finish top five in the superbikes at all this year, I'm gonna mm. be ecstatic. That's uh, that's my goal. I want to finish top five in the dry, pushing it as hard as I can in front of some good guys. And I think that would be my goal for this year and that super bikes, the baggers with knowing what, who's out there and what they're on. I mean, I know my team, they're not willing to back down. We, mm. we once again, don't have what those top times have, but like there's no electronics. So it does come back to just set up and me. And if I can get a bit more track time on the thing and get a little bit more comfortable, I could definitely see me back on the podium this year. And if it's if I'm feeling good and I'm in the right mindset, I, I'll go for that win all day. <laughs> Hell yeah, that's what I do here. Well, you've already got that podium now. So that whole thing of like, oh, just bring it home for the fans. Yeah, it's you can it's do over. That. It's done. You can it's win over. a race now. <laughs> yeah, now I'm going for the win. Yeah, yeah. definitely, definitely. I'm, I'm going for it. I want to stand on that top step. I haven't been up there in a minute, so mm. I used to be up there a lot as a kid, and I'm I'm a very competitive person. Even though I'm all smiles, I I get so angry sometimes. And uh, yeah, no, if I could if I could win a race again, oh my gosh, dude! Just to say that I beat everyone again would just be it'd be yeah, awesome. you are the man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that'd be epic. <laughs> well, brilliant. Yeah, I think that's all we've got time for, but. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been a blast. I've actually <laughs> genuinely really enjoyed it. I think it's one of my favorite ones I've ever done so far, to be honest. So Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And once again, yeah, thank you for your sponsorship for the last couple of years, man. It's yeah, been, you're welcome. Er- everything helps us for sure. <laughs> yeah, like I say, I always uh, help you. Like I'll share everything to my stories on Instagram and all that as well and just try and help boost you that way as well. And if there's anything else I can do let me know <laughs> definitely definitely <laughs> but yeah obviously if you are listening as well head over to max flinders uh instagram accounts and his social media accounts max 88 flinders on instagram and then on facebook i believe it's max flinders racing is that right yes sir that's our page <laughs> brilliant yeah so give those a follow i think there's a group on facebook as well a fan group as well so yes definitely they yeah. go hop in they're always talking about me in some kind of way <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah make sure to check him out and obviously best of luck as well this year max and the baggers and the super bikes i really hope to see you up there and scrapping it out and standing on the podium once again definitely i hope so for sure yeah well yeah thank thank you you again for your time i really do appreciate it yeah thank you man thanks for having me perfect right signing out this episode and we're back next week thank you very much goodbye